Hello everybody, just Miller Rocks on Cards Physics. We're going to be looking at some uh, impulse today. So let us just uh, go ahead and talk about that a little bit. So an impulse is ultimately just a force times the time interval over which that force is exerted. So what we want to do is see what we can do with impulse, what we can extract from it, and just another way of looking at what forces ultimately do to things, which we know, right? That force produces the acceleration of mass, the network then produces the change in kinetic energy, which has to do with the force over displacement. Now we're going to look at a force that is exerted over a time interval. So I've got this little cart right here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to exert a force on it over a small interval of time. So I come, I'm going to come with my hand. Whoa, what happened? I hit it. I was in contact with it for a very short interval of time but there was a force exerted over it, on it, excuse me, over that interval of time. And what happened? There was a change in motion of the object because the force produced an acceleration which produced a change in the object's motion. So this is what we want to do. We want to look at impulse in terms of a force over some sort of time interval and kind of uh, go from there. So let me get this out of the way here really quick. And let us just do this. So, we're going to start off with looking at the impulse due to a net force, which is constant, and then we can kind of um, expand on that. So, impulse is a force <coughs> multiplied by the time interval over which it acts. for a constant force we have i hat it's a vector quantity is equal to f hat times a delta t so i hat is the impulse vector Which happens to be in the same direction as the force vector under consideration. F hat is the force vector. And of course, delta t is the time interval over which the force acts. that we've got for a constant force. Great. Um, let's look at the units. Well, SI units of I have to be the units of F times a delta T, which is just newtons times seconds, right? So that's it. The SI units of impulse are newton seconds. Pretty straightforward there, and again, it is a vector quantity has a direction in the direction of the force under consideration. So generally, what we want to do with impulses is consider a net force, not individual forces so much. I'm going to add up what the net effect is and figure out what the overall impulse given to an object is. And for that reason, net force is generally what we want to be looking at. So for a constant net force. We have I hat is equal to sigma f hat times delta t. Well, let's see what we can do with this if we can extract out something that's a little familiar to us. So we know that sigma f hat is what produces the acceleration of the mass by Newton's second law. So we can rewrite this as I hat is equal to m a hat times delta t. Well, we're considering here a constant net force, thus the acceleration must be constant as well, because a constant force produces a constant acceleration. 
So I wonder if there's some sort of equations of motion for constant acceleration that can be utilized for this. Let's see. For constant acceleration, we have that V final is equal to AT plus V initial, right? T is just the time interval over which the object is accelerating, has some initial velocity, and has some final velocity based upon that acceleration. So this delta t here and this just t here, basically the same thing. It's the time interval. Generally, we start at t equals zero and then go on from there. So let us go ahead and stick this a delta t in for well, what we can get out of this. We can rewrite this as a times t is equal to a v final minus a v initial. And note that, yeah, we're talking about vector quantities here. So what do we have with this? This here is that right there. So we can write that i hat is, well, m multiplied by v final minus v initial. And we'll go ahead and throw the hats on there. v final hat minus v initial hat to make them explicit vectors there, as we know that they already are. And what do we have here? Well, we've got the impulse due to the net force. Does what? It does this. It produces a change. Yeah, we already know. It produces a change in the object's velocity because the net force produces an acceleration, which is defined by a change in velocity. But there's something more important in here. It's not just the velocity that it changes. It's the mass times the velocity of the object that it changes. Let us go ahead and define another quantity here. Let us define linear momentum. We're going to call that p hat. This is a lowercase p. I might have a problem doing lowercase for certain letters. But nonetheless, let us define linear momentum p hat as mv hat. An object of mass m moving with velocity v has momentum, which we're going to call p. We define a quantity, mass times velocity, the object's momentum. So what can we do with this? Well, now we can go ahead and say that the impulse due to the net force, i hat, produces a change in something, produces a change in the object's momentum. So that's the big picture here. We have that i hat equals p final hat minus p initial hat. Again, mv final hat would be p final hat, mv initial hat would be p initial hat. And what can we write this as? Delta p hat. The impulse due to the net force produces a change in the object's momentum. This is what we want to appreciate here. This right here, because it's meaningful. We've got a change in something that occurs due to force acting. Yeah. Just another way of representing things and understanding the behavior, excuse me, of systems. <coughs> excuse me. So now I can talk about objects' momenta mass times velocity, and look at impulses, and things of that nature. Some other things that we can do as well, because again, impulse is defined, again, we're talking about by a constant net force, is defined as sigma f hat delta t. So what if we do this? i hat is equal to sigma f hat times delta t, which produces the change in the object's a momentum. Well, let's look at this a little bit right there. Net force times 
the time interval which it acts produces the object's change in momentum. Well, let us rewrite this. Let us divide both sides by delta t. And we've got ourselves the net force is equal to delta p hat divided by delta t. What does that mean? Well, it means that a net force produces an object's change in momentum over some time interval. Change in momentum with respect to time. So, ooh, that's kind of important actually, because this is ultimately equivalent, in a sense, to mass times acceleration. Change in momentum with respect to time is another way of defining what a net force does. Net force produces an object's change in momentum with respect to time. Pretty cool. So, that's just an alternative way of looking at definition of net force. And uh, it's, it's kind of nice to, nice to see something good out of that. All right, so what if the force actually is not constant? Maybe we should save that. Now let's do a little problem with a constant slash average force just to see some familiar notions with this kind of go on uh, from there. So, let us look at a problem here. Yeah, here's the problem. All right, so we're gonna take ourselves a mass of 0 0.145 kilograms. And that's the mass of a baseball. <laughs> And we're going to take ourselves an average net force of, let's do 7,500 newtons. It's a pretty big force, but that's okay. An average force of 7,500 newtons that comes from ultimately a bat striking this baseball that's initially at rest. And the time interval over which this force acts we're going to say is equal to 7 times 10 to the negative 4 seconds, 0.7 milliseconds. Contact time between baseball bats and baseball is pretty small. That's okay. We're all going to, also going to say that V initial is equal to zero. This net force is in the I hat direction. We're sort of ignoring gravity because we're going to just go ahead and assume that this ball is suspended in midair. Maybe it's um, held up by a T or something, but that's okay. What do we have? The ball is sitting in there, this bat comes along, strikes it, and what does it do? It changes the momentum of the ball because well, it produces an impulse on the ball. So what we want to look at is some things regarding this. So let us do this. Let's look at part A. Let's look at what is the average acceleration of this ball. We want to know just what A hat sub average is. Well, we know this net force, or average net force, produces the average acceleration. So we could either say this is a constant force over a time interval or an average, really it would be more like an average, is something contacts something, when it first touches, it's not so hard, and then it releases its touch as it comes off of contact with it. Nonetheless, we've got this, this is pretty easy to figure out then. We've got ourselves some average acceleration is going to be equal to the net average force divided by the mass, which is 7,500 newtons, I hat, divided by 0 0.145 kilograms. Let's get this the calculator here. We've got 7500 divided by 145. Gives us 1,087.5. Meters per second squared, I hat. All right, so we get the average acceleration, big deal. Well, the average acceleration produces the object's change in velocity over that time interval of seven times 10 to the negative four. So that's something we've done before. We can figure out all the characteristics of its motion over that time interval, that's great. What we really wanna do is start looking at what's the impulse? What is the change in momentum? What's the final speed of the object based upon well, impulse and momentum? So, what do we do with this? Now we want to know 
what is the impulse, the average impulse over that time interval? Well, what do we have? We've got that this is just going to be equal to the net force times delta T, which is just going to be equal to 7,500 newtons multiplied by 7 times 10 to the negative 4 seconds, which is then equal to negative 4. And we've got ourselves 5.25. 5.25. Newton seconds. And that's I hat. That's I hat. And there we go. Impulse given to this ball overall is 5.25 newton seconds. All right. What about the object's change in momentum? What is delta p hat? Well, from what we've just done here, delta p hat and I had are the same things, quantity-wise. They're not the same <coughs> role measurement, in a sense. <coughs> They're two different things, but is the impulse produces the change in momentum. So they're equivalent to one another. We've got that this is equal to I hat, which then must be equal to 5.25. I'm going to be a little bit more careful here. However, because the unitization of momenta happens to generally be a little bit different. Even though it has to be newton seconds, if we look at momentum itself, units of a momentum, that is the units of mass times velocity, which is kilograms times meters per second. Kilogram meters per second. This is the same thing as a newton second, if you break it all down, but Generally, when you talk about momentum, changes in momentum, we utilize kilogram meters per second. So we know that we're talking about that particular quantity. So I'm going to call this kilogram meters per second, and that is in the I hat direction. Because again, we're asked for what is the change in the object's momentum. Finally, we are asked for, excuse me, what is the object's speed as it leaves contact with the bat, or what's the object's velocity as it leaves contact with the bat? Well, that can be extracted easily from looking at the object's change in momentum, because that is just going to be equal to P, let's do this, P final hat minus P initial hat, and change the momentum, which is equal to MV final hat minus MV initial hat, and what do we know about the initial velocity? Initial velocity was equal to zero. So that is zero. So we got ultimately the change in momentum is equal to the mass times the final velocity of the mass itself. And we've got then delta P hat is equal to MV final hat, giving us that V final hat is equal to delta P hat divided by m, which is equal to 5.25 kilogram meters per second i hat, divided by 0.145 kilograms, which gives us a grand finale for the final velocity of 5.25 of 36.2, we'll call it, 36.2 meters per second I have. There we go. There's the final velocity of this object based upon looking at impulse and the change in momentum. Could have done it with acceleration too, but we don't want to. We want to use momentum now because we can. It's another quantity that's very useful as we'll see as we proceed. This consequently is what, roughly 80 miles per hour, give or take a little bit, probably give a little bit 81 miles per hour. There we go. So if you want to take a baseball that's initially at rest and make it go from rest to about 80 miles per hour by striking it with a bat over a time interval of 0.7 milliseconds, the average force you're exerting on it is 7,500 newtons. It seems pretty big, but there's this huge force that the bat delivers to the baseball, um, just in general. Not depending on how hard you swing it, right? But that's dictating how much impulse there is and ultimately what the change in momentum and the final velocity of the object is.
All right, so we'll leave it at that for now. We're going to come back and look at some momentum and see why it's such a nice quantity and important. Um, that's it. All right, thank you.